my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling great. Hello and welcome back to Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. My name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer and I am your co-host. Today our guest is Dr. Johnny Bowden and what a special treat that is for me personally. Dr. Bowden, also known as the Nutrition Mythbuster, is a nationally known board certified nutritionist and expert on diet and weight loss. He has appeared on the Dr. Oz Show, Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, ABC, NBC, and CBS, and has contributed to articles in the New York Times, Forbes, The Daily Beast, The Huffington Post, Vanity Fair Online, Men's Health, Prevention, and dozens of other print and online publications. He is the best-selling author of 15 books, including The Great Cholesterol Myth, co-authored by Stephen Sinatra. His latest co-authored with Stephen Matsley, MD, is Smart Fat. Eat more fat, lose more weight, get healthy now. Dr. Bowden, how are you today, my friend? I'm great. No, thanks so much for having me, and please call me Johnny. All right, Johnny, Johnny. Uh, Tell our audience, for the few people out there who don't know who you are, uh, where you came from and how you became who you are. <laughs> I think it's maybe more than a few people, but that's very sweet of you to say. You know, I, um, I was a professional musician. Uh, this is a second career for me. It's kind of 25 years old, this career, but it's, uh, I, I did switch careers in 1990. So I came from a very different universe as a performer, as a conductor, as a pianist. And uh, my health was pretty much what you'd expect of a musician who came up during the 60s and Woodstock generation and sex, drugs and rock and roll. I was overweight. I smoked cigarettes. I was basically a mess. And uh, I got interested in health kind of because I was bored. I was on the road all the time. And, you know, the actors all took pretty good care of themselves. And they all went to the gym and lifted weights. And out of boredom one day, I just said, hey, why don't you teach me how to do some of this stuff? And like I think many people in, in, in my generation in this field, it, it, I kind of became a zealot when I saw what was possible, when I saw how my body transformed, how my energy transformed, my mental outlook transformed. And by the way, Noah, this was not an overnight thing. I was one of those guys who would go to the gym, do a bench press set, and go out and take a break and have a cigarette. So it wasn't like, you know, all of a sudden I saw the light. It was a slow transformation uh, for me. But it was a very profound transformation. It got me very interested in this whole field of health and nutrition. At the time, all we really had were ridiculous magazines like what we now call muscle and fiction and, and stuff like that. And there wasn't a lot of places where you could really learn about this. So I started being a, a kind of overachieving, uh, upper middle class, Jewish academic, New York kid. You know, the first thing I thought of is, I wonder if you can get a degree in this stuff. This stuff's really interesting. So I went in on kind of on a whim. Uh, got certified as a personal trainer. And I loved it so much, I got another certification and then another until I had ultimately collected six certifications in personal training and fitness. And uh, again, on a lark, uh, I noticed that there was a gym in my neighborhood in Manhattan, a new gym that was opening. It had this kind of weird name called Equinox, and it sounded really sexy and fun. And I just went in on a lark and said, well, I'm a personal trainer. I'd like to work here. And for some unknown reason, they hired me. And I spent about seven years as a uh, trainer at, at Equinox Fitness Clubs, um, uh, eventually becoming the, the dean of the Equinox Fitness Training Institute, which is kind of the model now for how personal trainers are trained across the country at just about every gym in America. And um, that's kind of how I got interested in this. And as a trainer, I used the exact same tools that we had all been taught to use, the low-fat diet, lots of aerobics. I believed, like everybody else, that if you were fat, it's because you ate too many calories and you didn't exercise enough. And that was the model. And I bought it lock, stock, and barrel. I, I was one of those guys who ordered an egg white omelet. And if it came back from the kitchen with a little bit of yolk, I would send it back because I just knew that was going to give you a heart attack. And I worked in that milieu for a while. I was lucky enough in the early 90s, uh, there was a biochemist uh, by the name of Barry Sears, who's now a household name in health and nutrition. He's the author of the Zone books and all that huge franchise, Zone bars, everything Zone came from Barry Sears, but nobody knew who he was then. And he came and he gave a lecture at Equinox. And he talked to us about 
a new way of looking at food and calories. And he said that it's not about the calories, it's about the effect that food has on hormones. Hormones are what drive weight gain. Hormones are what drive weight loss. Hormones are running the show. You have to look at the hormonal effect of food. And I remember saying to him afterwards, Dr. Sears, if what you're saying is true, then everybody else is wrong. And I don't know if you know Barry Sears, but he smiled, yeah. that smile of his, and he said, well, that's absolutely right. <laughs> and we became kind of friends. He, he actually wrote the introduction to my very first book, and I just interviewed him again recently for a summit that I'm doing on fat loss. And uh, that was kind of the beginning of me saying, wait, I think there's more to this nutrition stuff than I was taught in personal training school. And, you know, we learned everything we knew about nutrition from the god-awful American Dietetic Association, which has probably done more in this country to hold back the health of America than any other organization I know of. But we bought it. We bought it lock, stock, and barrel. Everything you need is in food. It's all about the calories. You don't need supplements. All of that 1950s claptrap that the American Dietetic Association taught us. And I had clients who were not listening to us. You know, this was the days of low fat and Atkins was kind of making a comeback. And these folks would do what we told them and they'd go on these low fat diets, these horrible low-fat diets that we now know are so bad and and they'd go on them and they'd you know get on the treadmill more and more and they just weren't losing weight and finally out of desperation they'd, they'd go on the atkins diet and we as trainers would say you can't do that man that's you know you might lose a pound or two but you'll get a heart attack this is going to be terrible and they'd come back and that didn't happen and Noah, I, I would see client after client come back and their blood pressure was lower, their HDL cholesterol had gone up, their triglycerides had dropped like a rock, they had more energy, their skin looked better, and, and they were not dying of heart attacks. And this made me think, I think we might not have been told the whole story when it comes to fat and cholesterol. Because really, when you think about it, what's the only reason you've ever been told not to eat saturated fat particularly and fat in general? Because it's going to raise your cholesterol. But what if cholesterol doesn't cause heart disease? And that was the subject of our book in 2012 that got so much attention on the Dr. Oz show and stuff, the great cholesterol myth. It is a myth. It doesn't cause heart disease. And once you know that, you have to ask, well, then why aren't we eating fat? And that's kind of what smart fat is about. You know, Johnny, I would say seven years ago, one of my first real introductions to this, I read a book called Eat Fat, Lose Fat by uh, Mary Enig and Sally Fallon. Oh, yes. And, and, and that changed my whole perspective on yeah. on eating. And yeah. that's why I'm so stoked, so excited for your new book, Smart Fat, because this, take, this takes that to a new level. You know, I've told my patients for the last six or seven years, and I tell this on any time I can, the, the greatest dietary transgression we've been sold is fat is dangerous and fat uh, is disastrous. You can say that again. It's just, it's just, it was the worst information. In the great cholesterol myth, we actually talk about the origins of this information, how we got on this crazy bad pathway to begin with. And it was a very interesting story, especially for people who are interested in politics. But we won't, we don't need to go into all of that right now. I will tell you that I took many classes with uh, Mary Enig and, and I've seen her speak and I've interviewed her because she's, she's passed away by now. And she was certainly one of the pioneers who was saying, hey guys, the Emperor has got no, no clothes. You're all on the wrong path. But of course, nobody listened in those days. Now, I think in 2016, you're probably going to see about 10 high fat diet books come out. And I, I think what we did in Smart Fat is, uh, I think, here's, here, no, here's what I see is one of the problems. So, okay, now we're beginning. And your audience is very sophisticated, very smart. They spend enough time to actually want to know about this and listen to podcasts like yours. But I think we, people are beginning to get the idea that, yes, we were wrong to banish fat from our diet. But what they don't quite understand is the difference between good fat and bad fat. Most people still think that bad fat is animal product fat. Any fat that comes from an animal is bad. Any fat that's saturated is bad. Any trans fat is bad. And everything else is good. And that's also 1950s past its expiration date knowledge. It's just not true. What makes a fat bad for you has nothing to do with whether or not it's saturated. And we go into great detail on that in Smart Fats. You're right. Trans fats, rightly so, have been demonized. But what many people don't know, one of the most important fats, congelated, congelated uh, Conjugated linoleic, linoleic acid, C C L A. Yeah, C L A, which helps burn fat, is is a natural trans fat found yeah. in healthy grass fed dairy. Yes. 
You're absolutely right. And I'll tell you the truth, and I'll let you in on this uh, audience. The reason I don't talk about that very much is because most people are not like your audience and don't understand these little details. So since 95% of trans fats are really bad for you, and what we're really talking about when we say trans fats are bad, we're talking about man-made trans fats. The CLA you're talking about comes only from natural grass-fed beef. But because that's a kind of small exception, and most people just – it's too much for them to even realize that all saturated fat isn't bad. We don't want to confuse them. So I just make the general statement that all trans fats are really, really bad. But you and I know that there is an exception, and the exception is CLA, as you mentioned, conjugated linolenic acid, which is found exclusively in the fat of grass-fed, healthy cows. Now, make – you're right, absolutely right, and it's important to make that distinction. Make the distinction between healthy saturated fats – and unhealthy saturated fats for our audience. I would audience. be delighted to. And I'll tell you a story which I think illustrates it the best. I live in Southern California. We had a big E. coli scare uh, a couple years ago. And it was traced to spinach. And they recalled all the spinach in Southern California. You couldn't go to a Subway sandwich spot and get spinach. You couldn't get it anywhere because of the E. coli scare. Now, nobody... Let me emphasize that nobody, not one health professional on the planet told people, hey, stay away from spinach. Spinach is a bad food. Everybody intuitively understood that this particular crop had been contaminated. It wasn't because it was spinach that it was bad. It was because it had been contaminated. Well, the same thing is true with saturated fats. There's... Fats are not bad because they're saturated. They're bad because they're contaminated. Now, in point of fact, most of the meat products we get in America are factory farmed. Now, for anyone who's never seen a factory farm, it bears no resemblance to the farms that, you know, I went to as a kid. Mr. and Mrs. Jones, they have a couple of cows and they graze peacefully on pasture and they chew their cud and they pick up some worms and insects of good sources of omega-3s and they're not fed any hormones and the kids milk the cows at four in the morning and they gather the eggs and the chickens run around, you know, pecking at the... That's not what a factory farm looks like. A factory farm is a multi, multi million dollar agribusiness of of over acres and acres of land where where uh, animals are kept in tiny confinement. They're fed grain, which isn't their natural diet. The grain is sprayed with all kinds of pesticides, which accumulate in the fat of these animals. The animals are fed tons of antibiotics for two reasons. One is they get sick on that diet. And two is they're kept in such confined quarters. And three, by the way, there's three reasons. And three is antibiotics make them fatter. Then they're also fed steroids. They're fed bovine growth hormone. They're fed other kinds of hormones. And of course, the fat from those animals is toxic. But it's not toxic because it's saturated any more than, you know, spinach has E. coli because it's spinach. It's, it's uh, that saturated fat. Those animal products are, in fact, toxic, but not because they're saturated. If you had that same saturated fat from grass-fed beef, which was raised humanely and which did, ate its natural diet and was not fed steroids and antibiotics and hormones, which all accumulate in the fat, it would be a perfectly healthy fat to consume. When I buy my grass-fed beef and they go, do you want the lean kind? I said, hell no. Yeah, <laughs> don't cut the, there's nothing to fear from the fat. If you give me factory farmed meat, I'm going to cut the fat away. I, I, I do the same. You're right. Now, Since you mentioned it, omega-3s, how about the distinction between omega-3 fats and omega-6 fats? Wonderful question. I'm so glad you brought it up. So we have been told part and parcel of this whole uh, misinformation campaign that we've been subjected to about fats is – Don't eat the animal fats, but eat plenty of vegetable oil. We all want vegetable oil. That's why we hold – in the 80s, they wiped out – frying in lard, all the fast food restaurants, oh, lard, that's a saturated fat. Let's go, let's get some canola oil. Let's get some soybean oil. Well, these oils are very, very high in omega-6s. Omega-6s are pro-inflammatory. 
Now, your audience knows this. I think the general public is beginning to get some knowledge of the, the role of inflammation. Your audience probably has heard many guests talk about it. Inflammation is probably the number one promoter of every degenerative disease we know of. There's inflammation component to obesity, to diabetes, to cancer, to Alzheimer's. Every one of them is loaded with inflammation. Time magazine even did a cover story back in the 80s called Inflammation, the Silent Killer, and they were right. The, the, the hidden link between inflammation and heart disease, diabetes, everything. So omega-6s are the progenerators. They are the, the, pro, the, 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 the parent molecules for inflammatory components in your body, and omega-3s are the parent molecules for anti-inflammatory uh, compounds in your body. Now, you actually need both, Noah, as you well know. Yep. And people often ask me, well, what do we need, the inflammatory compounds? And I just say, do you ever get a splinter? Do you ever get an abscess in your tooth? It swells up, right? Doesn't it get inflamed? That's part of the body's healing process. When you get a splinter or an injury in your foot, it gets swollen. It gets, it gets uh, filled with white blood cells. They try to surround the area to prevent a microbe from getting a hold from an infection starting. So you need to have the ability to have some inflammatory components in your bloodstream. The problem is, you think of it as like two armies, your anti-inflammatory army and your inflammatory army. They need to be funded with the same amount of money. So the ideal balance between the anti-inflammatory omega-3s and the pro-inflammatory omega-6s, which are found in vegetable oils like corn oil and soybean oil, canola oil and safflower oil and all those other oils you've been told to eat so much of, the balance needs to be about a one-to-one. -one. We are consuming 16 to 1 in favor of the inflammatory omega-6s. All of that vegetable oil, all of these wonderful, healthy, saturated fats like palm oil and coconut oil that we took out of our food to replace with canola oil and soybean oil are contributing mightily to our inflammation problem. And if you think inflammation isn't a problem, you haven't looked at the research recently. It is probably the biggest promoter of every disease you don't want to have. Tell our audience the best sources of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, my favorite is wild salmon or fish oil. I think that that's just, you know, that you really can't improve on that. And wild salmon, again, um, is less likely to have PCBs and other contaminants, and the omega-3 content is a little higher. So I'm a big fan of omega-3, uh, of, of um, wild salmon and, and cold water fish um, if I can mention a brand, I like Vital Choice. They, yes, they ship yes. right from Alaska. It's a great company, and I get all my stuff from them. Um, so that's my particular favorite source of omega-3s. Um, fish oil, I'm, I'm a big fan of Barleen's fish oil, but there's a lot of brands you can get in the store that are you know, really good fish oil products. Um, you can get omega-3s from uh, flaxseed and chia seeds. It is not quite the same omega-3 as the kind that's found in fish. It has to convert in the body, and that's not always an efficient process. So you know, if somebody isn't a vegan or a vegetarian, I'm a big fan of fish oil supplements on a daily basis for omega-3s. I agree. Now, when I was a kid growing up, I worked in the supermarket, and I, I, I don't know why I remember this, but I remember looking on packages, because that's what I did. Mm -hmm. um, it said, we've re now removed all tropical oils from yeah. our, our products. And yep. At the point, I had no idea what the heck um, right. tropical oils were, yep. but, but, but what they did was they took the tropical oils out, like you said, and put in all the trans fats and the right. polyunsaturated fats. Well, tropical oils are the palm oil, the red palm oil, and the coconut oil, like you mentioned. Yep. Well, the other day, I was in the supermarket, and I almost had an accident in my pants. Crisco <laughs> now sells coconut oil. Crisco, the <laughs> biggest purveyor of trans fatty acids ever. Yeah, ever lard in the history ever. of the world. And by the way, by the way, Crisco is not lard. When we talked about taking lard, lard's making a comeback. Real yes. lard from pastured pork is a perfectly healthy thing to cook in it. It stands up to heat beautifully. You can fry things in it if you are so inclined to fry anything. Way better. Than, than heating canola oil or soybean oil or got, that got off of Crisco vegetable shortening, which was never even a, you know, a real food. Heating those things to high heat is a monstrously bad thing to do, but real lard, not so bad. <laughs> right. So let's, we've talked about all the fats. We're on, on a, a great playing field now. Talk about the Smart Fat program. And I think there's four kind of food groups that you go through and recommend. So let's let's just bang those out in this letter audio sure. what it entails. Well, one one of the things we did in Smart Fat is we we actually have a different way of typing fats. Instead of it just being good and bad, we actually did 
smart, neutral, and toxic. So the toxic fats are clearly some of the examples of what we just talked about. Fat of any kind, saturated or other, from animals that have been contaminated with antibiotics and steroids and hormones. All right, so that's a, definitely a toxic fat. Man-made trans fats, the kinds we were talking about earlier, the hydrogenated oils, very, very bad, very, very toxic fat. High quantities of omega-6 vegetable oils, very toxic when they're very, in, you know, in the kind of proportion that we eat them in, in the typical American diet. Neutral fats are fats that actually have not been shown to have necessarily had any significant health benefits, but they also have absolutely no negatives. And in that, I would classify saturated fat from grass-fed beef. You can eat that as much as you till the cows come home, no pun intended. Um, the smart fats are ones that have actually been shown in research to have specific actual benefits, and that would include coconut oil, olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, and, of course, the omega-3s. The, so, the, so you asked about, I'm sorry, in our program, so we actually recommend that people get a minimum of five servings of smart fat a day. You can certainly have more. You can eat neutral fats like, you know, butter, uh, saturated fat from grass-fed beef, things like that, as much as you want. And you should have zero amounts of toxic fat. And then in addition, and I think this is what makes smart fat a different kind of program from any other high fat diet, we also are high in fiber. And it's, it's the one bugaboo, the one Achilles heel of all of the previous high fat diets like Atkins is that they just were too low in fiber, Noah. And, and what we have here is a high fat, high fiber diet, which I don't think I've ever seen before. So we actually encourage 10 servings of fiber a day. And it's not hard to get those 10 servings because a lot of foods like an avocado or a cereal serving of beans, we'll have like three servings just in, in one half cup. So right. it's not really that hard. Um, but we recommend legumes and beans and just about every vegetable you can mention and low sugar fruits like apples and berries and grapefruits and uh, fiber supplements. So it's definitely, you know, important that we get the fiber, that we get clean protein. We recommend five servings of clean protein a day. And you can imagine from the way we've been talking about contamination, what we consider to be clean protein as opposed to contaminated protein. And then the fourth component is something that isn't really talked about a lot in these books, and that's spices. And I think that's partly because my co-author, Dr. Stephen Masley, is actually a trained chef. He actually took a year off and studied at the Four Seasons. And he, you know, is a very adept user of spices. But what people don't realize is spices do two things. One, they make your food taste terrific which makes it much easier to stay on a program. But two, they're like a medicine cabinet that nobody knows about. Spices are the most anti-inflammatory, antioxidant-rich compounds on the planet. If you go to any one of those nutrition databases, you put in almost any nutrient, and you say, what has the most? Well, they'll tell you per 100 grams. The, the first 50 things on the list is almost always spices. Now, nobody eats 100 grams of a spice, but pound for pound, those things are just loaded with nutrients and loaded with antioxidants and are highly anti-inflammatory. So we make spices a big part of the Smart Fat program. Yeah, I, I, I challenge anybody to grow their, fresh, grow their own herbs or buy fresh herbs, start using them in their food, and, and tell me it doesn't taste uh, uh, exponentially better. Yes, exactly. And, and who's going to stay in a diet if it tastes like cardboard? So, you know, there's a couple of things that spices contribute here. One is they make it easy to stick with a program. And two is they're doing medicinal value as a compound to add into your diet. Right, right. Now, is dairy in your program? It's acceptable in the program, but we have the same caveat about dairy because dairy comes from the same animals that we're talking about. If it comes from factory farmed animals, it's going to have antibiotic steroids and hormones somewhere in there in the residue. I, I won't touch homogenized pasteurized milk. Um, organic milk, raw milk. Now, we're not allowed to. This is one of the beauties of the free speech in America that everybody thinks we have. We can't really go on and recommend raw milk. So, folks, I will only tell you that I drink raw milk every day, but I will not recommend raw milk because, God forbid, you know, somebody will sue me because somebody, you know, because that's not considered acceptable medical practice. My co-author wouldn't even consider like saying that on a video because of, you know, we'll, we'd be sued. Um, but I can tell you that Everyone I know who drinks raw milk doesn't get sick, but let's not let's not let's not make that the you know I don't I don't want <laughs> want this indigenous right. dairy industry coming after me. Um, but the point is, there's nothing wrong with dairy. Again, if the source of the dairy is pasture raised cows, and I think it's absolutely fine. How about grains? 
I'm not a fan. I don't think my co-author is a big fan. Um, you know, we don't forbid them. We, we certainly recognize that they can be very inflammatory for many people who have gluten sensitivities. Uh, the whole notion of, oh, well, we've got whole grains, whole grains, and they keep, the dietitians keep talking about whole grains, fruits, and vegetables like they're all uh, equal. In fact, grains are probably the most nutritionally weak component of that triad. Uh, they raise blood sugar just as much as the processed grains. It's such a myth that whole grains, you know, are so much better for you. If you look at the glycemic index of brown rice and white rice, they're like a point apart. I mean, so they do the same thing to blood sugar and weight gain as regular, you know, processed grains do. And, I, and they're not that nutritionally dense. So yes, we, uh, we recommend or, or allow, let's say, people to have small amounts of some of the healthier starches, like a little quinoa, a sweet potato once in a while, maybe a little oatmeal, fine. But, you know, all of this nonsense about whole grain cereals and whole wheat Cheerios, it's all nonsense. It's just not true. And you can live just fine without grains. So we allow them. We tell people to be judicious about them because they cause a lot of problems for a lot of people. And we tell people to be particularly careful of them if they're trying not to gain weight. Uh, I, I think your point of nu nutrient density is, is crucial. Now, you know, we can get lost in gluten sensitivity, but sure. the most important thing about grains is, is that they are extremely nutrient poor. Yes. So if, if you're <laughs> trying know. to create a healthy body, why are you, why is your diet going to be based on something that's so nutrient poor? As opposed it's, it's, to being something that's so nutrient dense, like what you're describing, it's a question I've asked myself for, for uh, over a decade. And and you know what's really interesting to me is you think about all these cereals; they're fortified. Why do they fortify them? You ever heard of fortified broccoli or fortified steak? <laughs> or fortified asparagus, they fortify them because the processing removes everything of any value and then they throw back the equivalent of a centrum, which is, you know, the lowest quantity of, of stuff, and now they say they're fortified with nutrients. How about getting foods that didn't need to be fortified in the first place? How about that? I agree. Now, if our audience wanted to get in touch with you, buy your book, what's the best way? Well, uh, we have a whole Smart Fat online program. Of course, the book is there available on Amazon. But if you go to johnnybowden.com and there's no H in Johnny, uh, or if you just uh, look at me on Twitter at, at Johnny Bowden, again, J-O-N-N-Y-B-O-W-D-E-N, we've got some webinar, free webinars coming up. Uh, and there'll be I'm not sure when the podcast will go live, but that webinar will be up with replays. And you can really hear us discuss this in great depth. Um, and there's, there's just a ton of smart fat. If you go to the smart fat website, you'll find out everything about the programs that we're doing, the products that we recommend and lots of other resources at smartfat.com. Any last words for us, Johnny? Uh, you know, I just, I, it, 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 I'll tell you, Noah, I've never liked bullies. And that's kind of been like a driving force in my life since I was about five years old and I saw a guy beating up a dog. I don't like bullies. And I don't like bullies whether they come from the American Medical Association, the American Dietetic Association, or any of these so-called health gurus who go around uh, uh, smugly proclaiming that, you know, fat is bad and statin drugs are good and everybody in the country should be on a statin drug and vitamins just give you expensive urine. They're full of it. And I just love taking these guys on in debates and just destroying them because they don't know what they're talking about. When you actually show them the research that refutes everything that they say, they crumble like a house of cards. And I just love going after those guys. John, you are a brilliant speaker uh, and, a, and, a, <laughs> and a brilliant man and have a, and a brilliant message. Thank you so much for your time today. Oh, uh, Noah, thank you so much. This has been just a joy to be on with you. And I hope we get to talk again real soon. I, I'm sure we will. My name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer, your co-host, and you are listening to the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. If you like what you've heard today, please share this with your friends and family and encourage them to subscribe on iTunes. You can sign up for our incredible weekly email at www.centerforepigeneticexpression.com and please let me encourage you to check out our first project summit at www.painreliefproject.com. Thank you, and as my oldest son Hayden says, be awesome and never unawesome.